My name is Aldo Macias Arellano, and I am a special assistant with the Office of the Los Angeles County Assessor. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all attendees and most importantly, our panelists. The Office of the Assessor has partnered with the Los Angeles County Department of Regional Planning and the Department of Public Works, as well as so SoCal Edison, to provide you helpful information regarding accessory dwelling units, also known as ADUs. I'd like to go over some housekeeping before we get started. During each of the presentation segments, attendees are encouraged to submit their questions live by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as possible before the conclusion of this program. After all of our panelists are finished with their presentations, we will proceed to a live moderated Q&A session where we will answer mo the most common questions we receive during the registration process. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and posted on the assessor's website, that is assessor.lacounty.gov. We will send a follow-up email with all the resources discussed today. I'd like to now introduce our panelists. From the Department of Regional Planning, we have Elsa Rodriguez, Senior Regional Planner, and Carmen Sainz, Supervising Regional Planner. From the Department of Public Works, we have Eric Lim, Senior Civil Engineer in the Building and Safety Division, and Jose Suarez, Senior Civil Engineer in the Land Development Division. From Southern California Edison, we have Ruby Rose Yepes and her team. Ruby is a Key Accounts Senior Advisor, David Ford, Public Affairs Manager, Daniel Pertusati, Covina Planning Specialist, Holly Esler, South Bay Local Planning Specialist, Anthony Lopez, Covina Planning Manager, Joseph Moreno, Covina Field Supervisor, Andrew Lopez, Covina Planning Specialist, and Kenneth Belrose, Vegetation and Land Management. From the Office of the Assessor, we have Jennifer Butzak, Director of District Appraisals, and Robert Isosaki, Special Assistance Constituent Services, and of course, Assessor Prank himself, who will now speak on the purpose of this program, but I will also introduce him. The Los Angeles County Assessor, Jeff Prang, was elected in 2014 as the 27th Assessor of the County of Los Angeles and re-elected in 2018. Raised in Warren, Michigan, Assessor Prang is a graduate of Michigan State University. After graduation, Mr. Prang relocated to California where he served nearly 18 years as a council member for the city of West Hollywood, including four terms as mayor, among many other positions in the public sector. Upon taking office in 2014 as the Los Angeles County Assessor, Mr. De Mr. Jeff Prang implemented sweeping reforms to ensure the strictest ethical guidelines rooted in fairness, accuracy, and integrity would uh, be adhered to in his office. Assessor Prang is a State Board of Equalization licensed appraiser, lives in Baldwin Hills with his husband, Ray, and is a frequent guest lecturer at local colleges and universities. Please welcome Assessor Jeff Prang. Thank you very much, Aldo. Thank you all for participating in today's webinar. I particularly want to thank um, our partners in hosting today's um, information webinar, uh, those from the department, County Departments of Public Works and Regional Planning, as well as our friends at Southern California Edison. Uh, we think that today is going to be interesting, informative, and help you uh, uh, navigate the, uh, the what sometimes can be a challenging um, uh, process of developing uh, and expanding property in LA County. So over the last five years, um, the assessor's office has witnessed a major increase in the interest in uh, alternative dwelling units. Uh, there's a lot of property owners who see them as possible solutions to big picture issues, uh, addressing our affordable housing challenges. Others just realize that they may need uh, space for or additional living quarters for parents, in-laws, children, or friends. Either way, LA County has over half its residential land dedicated to single family zoning, meaning what can be structured on these properties is of utmost importance to the entire region. Uh, whether it be the waiver of uh, various fees, uh, reduced uh, application review and approval times, uh, the recently passed Senate Bill 9, uh, passed last year, uh, legislation um, that has the stated intention of encouraging the development of more housing, including ADUs, uh, it's quite clear that many believe that accessory dwelling, dwelling units uh, will be an integral part of the foreseeable future. 
However, the large increase in interest in ADU construction and conversion has overwhelmed a lot of our traditional public education vehicles and a great deal more information is now needed for property owners to plan um, to make these additions effectively and wisely. Um, so I'm particularly uh, thrilled to have uh, these extremely uh, uh, knowledgeable partners join us from Public Works, Regional Planning and Medicine to help bridge the divide between uh, uh, the interest and execution of effective planning for an uh, ADU. I think it's safe to say that everybody here knows that there's plenty of hurdles to overcome whenever you're planning for the construction of, of any type of construction, uh, including that of an ADU. Uh, projects are often expensive, the rules can be opaque and complex, and the bureaucratic hurdles can at times seem overwhelming. I'm hoping that this uh, webinar will enlighten those in the process um, of, of planning or building and help alleviate some of the difficulties which can overcome uh, which can be overcome with uh, proper foresight and planning. Uh, as an example of this growing interest, the county has seen an increase of over 180% in permitted ADUs between 2017 and 2019, but with under 20% completion rate for those who began the application process. To put that in perspective, there's a, a little over 10,000 permitted ADUs in the county uh, over, with over 1.8 million residential parcels. Uh, there was a, uh, a motion adopted recently by the Board of Supervisors calling for the county to analyze the current application process and to provide recommendations for streamlining and simplifying the process. Um, however, those plans are still in their infancy um, and of the development and proposal stage. So that's something we're gonna be working on in the uh, weeks ahead. Uh, many of you are probably a, a, a tad confused what the assessor has to do with ADUs. Uh, in fact, there's a strong likelihood that many of you are not sure what the assessor does at all, frankly, uh, and I won't bore you with all the details. I just want to emphasize a few things. Uh, the building up and sometimes the alteration of existing structure uh, to be used as ADU is considered new construction for property assessment purposes. When, there's, when new construction, such as the addition of new residential units occurs, that property, that new construction will be reassessed and your uh, property taxes will be adjusted. A reassessment due to new construction does not mean that your entire property would be reassessed. Instead, the cost to construct that ADU is used to establish its value. The value is then added to the existing underlying, underlying assessed value of the land and other structures on the property, and the result will be a new uh, base year tax value for the entire property upon which future property taxes will be based. Uh, generally speaking, new construction is assessed using the cost methodology. And the costs used by the assessor's office may not necessarily be your costs, but rather they're standardized regional costs that are typical of materials and quality used for that, uh, uh, that construction. Uh, in general, replacing what is already there is not considered new construction. However, if you're altering a, altering a garage by adding uh, features necessary to convert it into living space, such as a kitchen or a bathroom, there will be an upward reassessment. Same thing if you decide to uh, uh, take your single family home and divide that into a duplicate, uh, into a du duplex. Um, adding bathrooms, adding kitchens are all uh, uh, assess reassessable events. Uh, the increase in property taxes obviously come after the whole permitting process, uh, but it does catch a lot of people by surprise and can cause uh, some hardship and anguish if you don't build that into your planning. Uh, that's why proper planning and uh, full foresight is really important. Uh, to make a quick example um, of how this works, if you construct an alternative dwelling unit and it adds $250,000 to the value of your property, your property taxes will increase by about $2,500 a year, or 1% of the value added to the property uh, through the ADU. The increase does not take into account, however, uh, additional uh, taxes or direct assessments that appear on your tax bill uh, that may be affected by the increase in your property's value. There's a lot of things on your tax bill that are not technically property taxes. They are um, direct assessments or voter, uh, voter indebtedness. Um, these figures aren't intended to alarm you, but simply to alert you that there are other tax issues that, uh, that you need to be uh, uh, prepared for. Um, as uh, will be highlighted by uh, our partners, if a project checks all the boxes on uh, a list of objective standards, it must be approved under this new state law. Owners of single family homes can add one ADU and a junior ADU, no matter how small the lot, uh, provided uh, certain conditions are met, even if they don't live there. Local governments do retain some authority to set objective standards for height limits, 
setbacks, parking requirements, and landscaping. But if the ADU is no more than 800 square feet and 16 feet tall, and a setback at least four feet from the property line, it's eligible for a permit in any residential or mixed use zone. An ADU can be built despite prohibitions placed by historic preservation districts or homeowners associations. Um, those are uh, subordinated to the, uh, the ADU law. Uh, again, as long as it meets certain conditions. And all uh, local officials must act on an ADU application within 60 days or else it is approved automatically. Um, an ADU is, uh, uh, you know, is oftentimes complicated, uh, it's costly. Uh, no matter how small it is, they require kitchens, bathrooms, sewer connections, a number of permits. There's a lot of caveats and details to everything I just mentioned, which is why getting this information out to the public is of utmost importance. Um, I did want to, uh, uh, one more thing I forgot to discuss that uh, SB9 does allow that uh, a single family residential parcel can be split into two lots. If you do a lot split, keep in mind that all the direct assessments, all the voter indebtedness will be divided between those two. To, uh, to lots as well. So not only will there be a, a reassessment for the new construction, but all those other taxes will be divided between two different parcels and something you wanna uh, uh, be aware of. Um, I think now we'll uh, answer some questions before we head into the next segment dealing with uh, um, other, as other aspects of uh, building ADU, um, that of uh, encroachment, easements and utilities. So do we have... Uh, Questions, Aldo, how do you want to do this? Actually, thank you, Assessor Prang. We're, we're going to move on to the next sec uh, segment, and then we'll do a live Q&A se session at the end of the presentation. So thank you very much, Assessor. We will now move on to our next segment, which is a presentation from the, the, county, uh, the Los Angeles County Department of Regional Planning, presented by Elsa Rodriguez, Senior Regional Planner. Welcome, Elsa. Hello, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elsa Rodriguez, and I'm joined by Carmen from the Department of Regional Planning. We are here to provide you with an overview of our permit process for ADUs and junior ADUs. We implement Title 21 and Title 22, the planning and zoning code for the unincorporated communities of LA County, not cities. Given the statewide housing shortage, our legislature has passed several laws to ease restrictions and increase housing supply. The ADU ordinance is one of several housing initiatives to encourage property owners to build housing. Although some ADUs may never get built, we have approved approximately 1,000 ADUs every year for the past five years in the unincorporated communities of LA County. So how do you verify if your property is in an unincorporated LA County community or in a city? You can look up an address or assessor's parcel number known as an APN on Znet from our website. For example, if your property is in the city of Inglewood or the city of Covina or any other city, you are not within our jurisdiction and should contact the respective city. Zenit will highlight the unincorporated community in blue, such as West Athens, Westmont, as shown on the screen. And Zenit will also tell you the property zoning. Slide. The chart outlines requirements from, for ADUs when there is an existing or proposed single family residence on site. Different requirements apply if the ADU is attached or detached, if the ADU is new construction or a conversion. Also on the chart are junior ADUs, which are only allowed within the existing space of a single family residence, such as an attic, for example. They are limited to 500 square feet and the owner must live on site. On the screen is our first example, a new construction 600 square foot detached ADU. The minimum required setbacks are four feet for both side and rear yards. This applicant proposed five and six. This ADU is only one story, but may go up to 25 feet in height or whatever maximum is allowed by the community standards district unique to that community. The separation between the ADU and existing home is six feet. 
the applicant proposed eight feet. Next slide. And the same standards apply to this example, except this is a two-story ADU new construction with the maximum allowed 1,200 square foot floor area. Notice how the existing house is actually smaller than the proposed ADU. Notice how the existing house is one story, but the ADU is two stories. For us, with jurisdiction over the unincorporated communities, that is allowed. But regulations may differ in other cities. ADUs are also allowed in multifamily properties. A multifamily property is any site with apartment buildings, duplexes, triplexes, multiple detached SFRs, or a combination of all. If you are proposing new construction, a maximum two detached ADUs limited to 16 feet in height are allowed. If you are proposing conversion of an existing space, one ADU or 25% of existing units, whichever number greater is greater, is allowed. Junior ADUs are not allowed on multifamily properties. The next example is an existing duplex where the applicant converted the existing garage into an ADU. Because it's a conversion of existing space, the required setbacks and height for regional planning are just those that are existing. Now let's assume this applicant wanted to add the ADU above the garage instead. Setbacks for the ADU would be four feet and the existing garage could remain as is. The design would be jagged, but otherwise allowed by us. The maximum height would be 16 feet for the entire structure. All roof drainage would have to be diverted on site and any staircases, balconies, and patios would be subject to regular setbacks. Second story construction has more structural and cost implications to consider. And lastly, we encourage all property owners to research restrictions from SoCal Edison. This is an existing 23 unit apartment complex and the applicant chose to split one existing unit into two smaller 300 square foot ADUs, which qualifies under the existing space conversion. The applicant could have proposed six ADUs here because 25% of 23 units runs up to six. For this example and all other examples, no additional parking is required for the ADUs or the existing use on site. Our timeline for review is 60 days after a complete application and fees are received. The approval is valid for two years and is eligible for a one-year, one-time extension. Once you have determined your property is an unincorporated, you may apply and pay fees online on Epic LA. Upload the land use application, pictures, a site plan, floor plan, floor plan and elevations drawn by a professional so we can determine if the ADU complies with all development requirements. Also on the slide are, are hyperlinks to our ADU summary and ADU project page. All of our approvals are made public online via Epic LA. And now for frequently asked questions. Do ADUs count towards lot coverage or FAR? No, what is required for a kitchen? Stove, refrigerator, and sink. Are they allowed on hillsides or high fire areas? Yes, on hillsides, which are, 20, are sites with 25% or slope of slope or greater, and only in high fire areas if they can meet road width requirements and have two means of highway access. Does the owner have to live on site? Only for junior ADUs. Can existing unpermitted structures become ADUs? Yes, but must comply with all current requirements. Where can I learn more about housing initiatives? Housing initiatives include density bonus, building housing in commercial zones, compact lot subdivisions, and recently SB9, which allows a second single family home in an existing single family zone. If your property is in an unincorporated community, you may contact us via email, in person at one of our eight field offices or virtual appointment. Thank you. This concludes our presentation. For site-specific questions, please contact regional planning staff. We are happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Elsa. And again, I would like to remind everybody that if you have questions, please answer them on the Q&A 
function of the bottom of your screen. We are trying to get to as many as possible before we conclude today's presentation. So up next, we have a presentation from the LA County Department of Public Works presented by Eric Lim, Senior Civil Engineer, and Jose Suarez, Senior Civil Engineer. Thank you. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Aldo and Elsa. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Eric Lim, and I'm with LA County Public Works Building and Safety Division. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jose Suarez. I serve as a district office manager for the South Whittier BSD office. A blurb about BSD. We have 11 district offices throughout the county, and we provide BSD services to 14 contract cities. BSD is part of the larger development services core service area. A key note, as Elsa mentioned, this permitting process is for unincorporated county areas only and not for areas under city jurisdiction. You'll wanna check with your respective city planning and building departments on their requirements or see if your city is serviced by BSD. I do wanna take a moment to pause. I've heard from some applicants that they feel the permitting process can be daunting and draconian. Our goal for this presentation is that you will walk away from this webinar more informed on how to quickly permit your ADU. We want to make the expectation as clear as day to streamline the process. So speaking of that, so that we're speaking the same language, I've defined a few acronyms used in this presentation, BSD for LA County Building and Safety Division and PC for Building Plan Check. As you can see, here's a flow chart. Before we get into the flow chart, I'd like to talk about BSD's role in the permitting process. BSD implements the minimum building code requirements. They are stipulated in county code titles 26 to 31 and building energy efficiency standards are stipulated in California code title 24 part six. As you can see, this is a high level flow chart showing the BSD permitting process. As you can see, it's quite complex. I've tried to break it down to 11 main steps. The bookends of the process are identifying jurisdiction and it's bookended by certificate of occupancy. We will drill down to each step in the subsequent slides. Next slide, please. So drilling down, step one, identify jurisdiction. First step is to see if you are in county BSD jurisdiction. To do so, you'll see the link to the Public Works Service Locator website here. Secondly, obtain planning approval. Also just cover this, you'll need to obtain planning approval. Thirdly, no BSD requirements. The more familiar your design professional and contractor are with the county code requirements, the faster the process will be. We often get the question, how can I expedite the process? I describe it as analogous to a professor telling you what will be on the exam. Through the ADU checklist and guidelines, BSD is essentially spelling out the main building code items we are looking for during PC and inspection. Next slide, please. Step four, hire a design professional. The owner would hire a design professional to prepare construction plans to submit for PC. Next would be apply. You would apply to BSD through Epic LA. You would upload the PC submittal. Next slide, please. After that would be plan check review. Uh, once the Epic LA app is processed, PC fees will be invoiced and an email notification will be sent to the applicant at each step. PC approval, this is the halfway point. The plans will be approved once it's determined that they meet code requirements. Next slide, please. Agency clearances, this will be discussed further in subsequent slides. Step nine, permit issuance. Once the agency approvals are cleared, your permits are ready to issue. The permits need to be pulled within one year of the application date, or you need to request extensions. Step 10, inspections. We're nearing the finish line with this. Once permits are issued, you would contact your respective BSD office to request inspections. Next slide. Certificate of occupancy, the finish line. After all inspection sign-offs, then a certificate of occupancy would be issued. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the BSC project valuation, it's based on the Marshall Swift valuation guide or the applicant's anticipated construction costs, whichever is higher. This valuation is used only to determine BSD, PC, and permit fees. It's a key clarification if you were to juxtapose that against uh, what the assessor just covered. This BSD valuation is not used to determine property tax assessments. You could reference the previous slides regarding cost methodology. Next slide, please. PC submittal requirements. 
Drilling down a complete PC submittal would look like the following. Architectural plans, this is similar to the planning submittal. Structural plans and structural calcs if applicable and Title 24 energy sheets and calcs. I do wanna take a moment to pause and talk about um, a key part with this. The energy standards require that a new ground up detached ADU also install solar. This would need to occur at the same time as the ADU construction. So definitely want to keep that in mind as you plan your ADU project, if it is a new ground up detached ADU. Looping back on the ADU checklist. So if we can pull up the ADU checklist, uh, you'll see that these are the major ADU code requirements. Um, so you'll see it, this is like a checklist here. And uh, one caveat is that it is not inclusive of all requirements. I do wanna highlight one checklist item. It's item A6 on the front sheet there. Um, it says, note, fire sprinklers are required for the ADU if the SFD is sprinklered. S SFD meaning a house. So let me break it down to an example. Older houses typically don't have fire sprinklers as such the ADU would not be required to have sprinklers. However, there is an exception to this rule per LA County Fire. You can reference the guidelines for more detail. For PC, back to the slides, for PC requirement questions, uh, BSC offers virtual appointments with the PC engineer, and you'll see that link on the presentation. So next slide, please. Agency approvals, um, if we'll, if you'll click the ADU guidelines, um, that will take you to a, a list and FAQs of the typical agencies for ADU. Um, so see it here. So this is the ADU guidelines. Um, I wanna highlight one agency, it's on the bottom of the sheet. It's in regards to local water company. Uh, actually one sheet before that. Okay, so the local water company Form 1A5, the purpose of this is to confer, confirm sufficient fire flow at the adjacent fire hydrant. If the fire flow is not sufficient, then fire department approval is not required. Back to the slides, please. So I'm gonna go over an example project agency referral sheet. Next slide. So this is a screenshot of a, uh, an example, and it will list all the required agencies for a respective ADU project. BSD would provide uh, a project-specific agency referral sheet at submittal, and the contact info would be shown on the referral sheet. Important note, separate submittals are required by the applicant to each agency. BSD does not route the project to the various agencies and the agencies need to be cleared by BSD prior to permit issuance. I would say uh, one helpful tip is to go on to our County Public Works BSD website for comprehensive instructions and FAQs. It's linked on the previous slides. So I do wanna thank you for your time. I trust that you'll walk away from this presentation more informed on how to permit your ADU. Now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Jose Suarez for associated work within public right away. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Jose Suarez. Uh, I'm a senior civil engineer uh, with the Los Angeles County uh, Department of Public Works, uh, Land Development Division. Uh, our role uh, is, is a minor one. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's very important to, to know about. Unlike building and safety, the focus is on the primary uh, property. When it's our review, we are looking more on the public right-of-way uh, side of things. Uh, and as part of the process, the Department of Regional Planning submits uh, consultation reviews to our department uh, in which we review uh, any proposed street improvements uh, along the frontage of the property, if any, and uh, primarily for safety and compliance with county standards. If there are street improvements being proposed, uh, a road construction permit will be required for any work to be uh, performed within public right of way. Uh, an example, uh, you know, driveway, sidewalk, uh, curbing gutter type of work, et cetera. Um, if there is any uh, additional uh, uh, information needed in regards to this, uh, you may uh, access the uh, link provided at the bottom uh, for land development services information. And with that, I thank you and uh, pass it on to Alba. 
Thank you so much, Jose and Eric, for that presentation. Again, uh, just because we're getting questions about this, the recording will be available on the assessor's website, assessor.lacounty.gov, within one or two business days. So please uh, keep a lookout for the recording uh, if you need it. There's a lot of good information that, that is being shared today. And so our next presentation is from Southern California Edison. And I will kick it off to Ruby Rose Yepes, and she will introduce her team. Welcome, Ruby. Welcome. Thank you, Aldo. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Elsa and Eric and Jose for sharing that wealth of information on your agency's requirements for ADUs. My name is Ruby Rose Yepes, a senior advisor with Southern California Edison, supporting all of our new construction customers, both uh, residential and commercial. So if you have anything in that sector, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. As California works through addressing the need for housing, SCE continues to address the need for a clean energy grid. And in doing so, we also understand the importance of providing affordable energy for everyone in a safe manner. Today, we... Um, Today we have a collective group of SCE team members from local planning, local government and real estate that will share insight on SCE's utility requirements and process for ADUs. The SCE team will cover the following topics, SCE's mission, GO95 requirements, temporary power poles, easements, encroachments, and new service request process. We will be sharing the slide deck with you all attendees after the workshop, as Aldo mentioned, so you don't have to write ferociously uh, to get all the notes jotted down. Southern California Edison's mission is to provide our customers with safe, reliable, affordable, and clean energy. And we are here to do just that, to serve you with reliable, affordable, clean energy as expeditiously and safely as possible. Next, my peer, David Ford, with our government relations team, will share with you a core value of Southern California Edison. Thank you, Ruby. As Ruby just stated, our primary focus is to deliver is delivery of safe and reliable and affordable electricity. Edison also values the partnerships with local governments and stakeholders to address the housing crisis in Southern California. As we make investments back into the grid on a regular ongoing basis with a focus of maintaining a grid that is safe and reliable and affordable, uh, we do this with the engagement of partnerships like Los Angeles County. Today, you will learn more about the electrical service requirements to ensure that your structures do not encroach upon SEE's infrastructure. As you see the growth in accessory dwelling units, we want to make sure that our customers as well as our employees maintain a safe and, and, and a safe distance from these dwelling units as they're being constructed. To start that conversation off, you will next hear from Daniel Percasati, who will go over the SCE electrical service requirements. Thank you, David. Again, my name is Daniel Percasati, and I'm a local planning specialist in SCE's Covina District. It's important that you contact your SCE local planner early in the process. There is no need to wait for local permits or to have completed drawings or plans. This can be accomplished by calling the SEE General Services line and creating a service request. The General Order 95 is the CPUC's rules for overhead electric line construction, which includes minimum clearances and safety guidelines. These minimum clearances expand during construction to allow equipment and personnel to maintain a safe work environment. As you can see in GO95 Table 1, it is important to consider working space when building an ADU. Although the ADU is meeting all minimum clearances, an individual standing on the scaffolding would enter the prohibited zones. Next slide. The construction of an ADU commonly causes GO95 infractions. Contacting SEE prior to construction will help identify, avoid, or allow the time to develop corrective actions to avoid GO95 infractions. 
If GO95 refractions are not identified prior to the start of construction, they will need to be corrected prior to providing electrical service to the ADU, which can cause significant delays. This photo displays what would become a GO95 refraction. Once the ADU is built, the roof of the structure would impede on the minimum clearance for the existing service wire to the primary home. A simple solution would be to install a temporary power pole moving that service wire during the construction of the ADU. To speak more on temporary power poles is Andrew Lopez. Well, thank you, Danny. Hello, I am Andrew Lopez, a planner specialist with Southern California Edison. I will briefly discuss temporary power, also referred to as TPP. Often when a customer has new construction, they may need a temporary power source while building. You can follow the flow chart as I explain a typical TPP request. Customer calls in a TPP request for service, which then generates a service request for the planner. The planner will then make customer contact to discuss the details as to provide the forms that are needed to be completed. The customer will then need to provide SCE with a location so SCE can approve. Once this portion is completed, invoice will be sent out and service order and premise number will be provided to the customer so they can call in to make application for service. Once completed, the customer should have the TPP installed and obtain city inspection. The planner will verify TPP setup and will schedule the TPP to be energized. Well, next slide, please. This is a picture of an unimproved TPP. The TPP is too close to the new structure being built and this TPP is being used without a city inspection. This is a, this is a violation of SCE rules that can cause termination to the service to the TPP. Generally, the TPP process takes five to 10 business days to get energized once all requirements are met. Thank you and up next is Ken Bellarose. Hi, my name is Ken Bellrose. I work for Southern California Edison Tech Specialist. I'll be discussing SE distribution line easements and encroachments. This step is very important as we want to make sure that you do not only does your new structure not encroach, but that there is no safety risk to workers during construction or occupants afterwards. Distribution line easements are for facilities that carry a voltage below 500 kV. A customer should approach SE first before developing their plan so we can work with you to address easement conflicts. It is the responsibility of the property owner to know that SE has an easement and to provide proof when building a structures near poles and conductors. Distribution lines can be identified by consulting the title company and requesting a detailed plan report. You also can request a rights checks from SE for a flat fee of 500 for the first three hours and 100 per hour for every hour after the initial three. Consult with your local planner to obtain an application. No building should begin to prior to verifying easements to avoid having to tear down or re relocate a structure. Next slide, please. A public utility easement known as a PUE is not an easement to SC as shown on a file subdivision track or parcel map. PUEs are dedicated to a city or county for the public utility purpose under the owner's statement of a subdivision map. SC acquires its rights by a separate grant of easement. Next slide, please. Here is a letter to how to request an encroachment instruction letter which lists items required to process an encroachment request. Also at the bottom of the letters are contact information and a link how to obtain a copy of this letter through se.com. Thank you, and now I'll turn this over to Holly Essler, South Bay Planning, uh, Planning Department. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Next slide, please. Hi, my name is Holly Essler and I am the planner for the South Bay District and I handle the city of Inglewood. Um, so I'm pretty much going to wrap up here. Everything, a lot of the stuff that you've learned today 
Um, GO95 clearances, encroachments, temporary power pull request, all of that starts with your planner. Um, and in order to kick off your, your project for your ADU in a, um, an efficient and safe manner, first thing you would do is call in your meter spot request or a request for clearance checks to our 800 number. An SCE planner will contact you within two business days of receiving the request and provide a detailed communication for submitting the required documentation. Please provide your email address with the service request for fastest communication. One of those documents, which is very important to our process, is the customer project information sheet. Please be sure to complete that with all fields when you return it to your planner. If you're not sure of how to answer some of those questions, consult with your architect, general contractor, or with your planner from Edison. You will also be requested to provide site and elevation plans in a PDF format. If you have it available, a detailed load schedule would be helpful to Edison so that we can determine if our transformers are properly sized to serve the additional load that your ADU will bring to the grid. If you're not sure how to do those calculations, consult with utility, uh, consult utility industry experts or an electrician to help you calculate that demand. Once the planner receives all required documentation, a site visit will take place, an approval or recommended plan changes will be provided within 24 hours of the site visit. Next slide, please. Uh, keeping our workers and, and you safe. When you're installing your panel, there are some considerations for worker access and clearance and separation of utility lines. For instance, the diagram on the left and the right are both part of Edison's electrical service requirements document, which can be found at sce.com. Figure on the left, 5-4, shows the required separation of plumbing fixtures and gas lines from Edison panels, or from your, your panel. The separation from plumbing is 18 inches and 36 inches from gas. Figure on the right shows the minimum required work clearance for Edison workers to safely work on your panel, install your meter, and connect your service to the weatherhead on your roof. That distance is three feet in front of the panel minimum and a foot and a half on each side from the center of the meter. It is also good to maintain a minimum of 10 inches of clearance from your panel edge to any window frames or edges of building. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, the weatherhead and clearances again, when we connect your service from the pole, we have to get up to the roof of the building. Normally, uh, a 10, 10 story, or I'm sorry, a 10 foot building, which is one story, would be a um, four feet clearance required. If you notice the diagonal line to the left, that's representing the ladder. This example shows a two story home. We need eight feet of space to attach the connection to the top of your head, of your roof. So four feet horizontal for every feet, 10 feet vertical is the simple rule to follow. All right, next slide, please. So just to recap, key contacts and where to start, local planning, submit your service request to our 800 number. It is best to do this prior to designing. If you already have a design, start this process immediately and before building. Consult SCE's electrical service requirements at sce.com. If you have questions or requests for encroachment, you would contact Ken Middlerose or Jeff Clark. New construction and major projects can be uh, submitted through Ruby Rose Yepes. And any questions for what questions for government affairs in LA County can be directed to David Ford. And with that, I'm going to hand it back off to Ruby. Thank you, Holly. Um, one last thing that I did want to share with our attendees today is an ADU incentive program. Um, as California moves towards a clean energy future, there are incentives for those who take a proactive approach to adopt and implement clean energy technologies such as heat pumps and building all electric buildings, reducing which reduces the carbon impact on the environment. 
a statewide, a statewide program that is being offered by the four IOUs, Southern California Edison, PG&E, San Diego Gas and Electric, and SoCal Gas is called the California Energy Smart Homes Program, which offers incentives for ADUs. And the incentive amount for all electric ADUs this year is $1,700. The incentive amount, though, will decrease annually for the life of the program, which is with which is um, set to sunset within the next four years. If you have any questions about the program, please contact the Energy Smart Home team on the email provided on this slide, or you can also reach out to me as well. And with that, I will kick it back to the assessor's office team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Southern California Edison team, and thank you also uh, Regional Planning and Public Works for providing very thorough presentations. And with that said, we will now move on to a live moderated Q&A session where I will ask questions to all of our panelists uh, from the questions we received during the registration process. So we've compiled the most common questions, and I will get us started by directing uh, some of the questions we received pertaining to the Office of the Assessor. And so the first question is, does a reassessment based on the construction of an ADU comply with Proposition 13? Yes, yes, it does. Um, Proposition 13 governs all reassessment in uh, in California, including new construction. So uh, a, an ADU does not pose any particular challenge for, for our office, other than perhaps uh, more workload. We will apply the cost methodology to, um, to new construction projects. Uh, we use uh, uh, standardized um, uh, manuals for cost, quality, uh, and, and construction. We also rely on Marshall and Swift. It's important to note that your cost, while we do, uh, is, is part of the uh, evaluation, uh, the standard that Proposition 13 requires us to apply is fair market value. So your cost will be instructive, but it may not necessarily be the, the same thing if we, uh, the same cost that we apply. Um, other things that I, that I mentioned previously that, so we will use the cost methodology to determine the value of the new construction. But if you are um, splitting a single family home into a duplex, uh, splitting a lot and adding a fourplex, uh, there will be um, uh, other costs as well, such as the, the splitting of the direct assessments and voter indebtedness um, uh, to each parcel. Thank you so much, Assessor Prang. And so I will just, so, so we have equal time, uh, I will ask the direct my next questions to the Department of Regional Planning. And one of the, one of these questions I thought was really exciting. Uh, the question is, can I Airbnb my ADU? No, you cannot. Awesome, so I have another question for uh, Regional Planning. Can you describe where an ADU is not allowed? Yes, um, ADUs are not allowed in industrial zones. Um, for example, uh, M M1, M2, M3, M4 um, zones. So there's, uh, in the county, we have several zoning uh, categories or classifications. Um, and in those zoning, within those zoning categories, it'll list, um, the uses that are permitted and uses that are prohibited. So um, in the industrial zones, they're prohibited and there's some commercial zones where, um, uh, heavy commercial zones where uh, they may not be allowed. Thank you so much, Carmen. And now this question is directed to the Department of Public Works. What can I do to expedite the ADU permitting process? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Um, I would have your design professional and contractor familiar, familiarize themselves with the ADU guidelines. Secondly, ensure your design professional completes and submits the ADU checklist with the PC submittal. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. And now we have a question that came in uh, during the live uh, Q&A function. This one's directed to SoCal Edison. If uh, What happens when load is not sufficient at the transformer after submitting 
a load schedule? I can answer that. Edison will upgrade the transformer and that will not be at any cost to the customer. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question is for the Office of the Assessor, and we have um, Director Jennifer Budsack here on this call. Uh, this question is addressed um, to you. Is the square footage added by an ADU counted towards the square footage of the main residence? Hello. All right, so um, it depends. If it is a junior ADU, the junior ADU is built within the existing SFR structure and the junior ADU, which is less than 500 square feet, will be added to the square footage of the main residence. However, if the ADU is greater than 500 square feet, it is not added to the main residence. What happens on the assessor records is, the assessor records will show your main residence, your main dwelling with your square footage, and will denote the square footage of your secondary unit or the ADU. Thank you, Jennifer. And while we have you, I have another follow-up question. Will the square footage used to calculate the value of my ADU be the same as the square footage used to calculate the value of my main residence? It depends. Um, If the quality of the ADU is generally similar to the main dwelling, we will use similar cost tables. However, ADU cost adjustments may differ from the main residence. So it's important for us to get the full scope of the picture of the work so we can provide um, accurate assessments. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And now moving on to regional, uh, regional planning. What's the difference between a pool house, guest house, and an ADU? Uh, great question. So a pool house is specific for its accessory to an existing swimming pool. And the maximum size for a pool house is 250 square feet. And it's basically a room with a full um, bathroom. Um, the intent of the pool house is to um, the accessory to folks that use a swimming pool. Um, whereas the ADU is another, basically another house. It's a structure with a full kitchen, a full bathroom, and can be rented out. The pool house cannot be rented out. Uh, the pool house cannot have any kitchen facility, um, and it cannot uh, exceed 250 square feet. Got it. So I think this next question uh, connects, you know, what you just explained, and this one would be directed to the Department of Public Works. Is the question reads: Do I need to install a separate utility meter or a separate main service panel for an ADU? Thanks for that question. No, um, you do not have to. However, the owner can request a separate utility meter or service panel if desired. Thank you, Eric. And uh, another question for regional planning. Are ADUs allowed if there is a homeowners association? Hello, uh, that's a good question. Um, so um, we look at the property to see if um, it's zoned for residences. Um, the code does allow for an ADU, but we recommend the applicants or property owners to check with the homeowner association. Um, not all homeowner associations uh, allow ADUs. Um, so we look at the code, if the code allows it, we approve it, but we do not enforce um, the homeowner association or the CCNRs that are imposed by uh, the homeowner association. So if you are, in a condo development and there's an HOA, um, please contact the HOA or look at your CCNRs. Thank you, Carmen. And now uh, back to Southern California Edison. Um, does Edison have concerns with, with ADUs built within existing easements? Yes, this is Ken Belrose with Vegetation Land. Yes, they do should verify 
that would be an issue due to the fact if it does encroach, we got to make sure that it meets our GL95 clearances before they start construction. They need to verify how wide the easement is to continue with their ADU construction. Thank you, Kenneth. And so I would like to take it back to the Office of the Assessor and the next, I believe, uh, Assessor Prang covered this briefly in his introduction, but because we received this question so often, Assessor Prang, can you tell us again, when an ADU is built, is the entire property reassessed or the value of the ADU added onto the value of the property's existing assessment? The latter, the new construction value is added to the underlying um, assessed value. We do not reassess the market value of the entire property, um, just the new construction. Thank you so much, Assessor. And I guess the next question pertains to our department as well. Um, can the assessor accept a homeowner's actual cost if verifiable for evaluation purposes? if they are less than the assessor's cost figures. I'm gonna pitch that one over to Jennifer. Hello, all right. So the short answer is it depends. Um, for new construction valuation purposes, we do use the cost approach. And these costs include direct costs like materials and labor and indirect costs, including architects and engineer fees, permits and contractor fees. So we will review the homeowner's costs and determine if that reads the market rate criteria for the quality of the construction. So in some instances, we may accept the reported costs. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I'd like to take it back to um, the Department of Public Works. And so the question reads, is the permit and PC fee schedule the same for an ADU project in all unincorporated county communities? Yes, uh, the fee schedule is the same for all unincorporated communities for both permit and plan check fees. Uh, that said, the fees are based on the project valuation. So with the lower valuation, the fees will be lower. Thank you, Eric. And while I'll have you here, um, I have another question for you. Do I need to obtain a separate address for an ADU? Yeah, this kind of segues off the other question about the separate utility meter. Mm -hmm. So if you have a separate main panel for your ADU, then for billing purposes, you will need a separate address. Um, also, there's another scenario where a separate address is required. It's when an ADU has a separate driveway or street access from the main house. Um, all this is detailed in the guidelines, so I would definitely recommend taking a look at that as well. Thank you very much, Eric. And so with that, this concludes today's webinar on ADUs. I wanna thank everyone for taking some time to join us today. And remember that this webinar will be posted on the assessor's website, assessor.lacounty.gov. Please give it a day or two, one or two business days. There will also be a post webinar survey and we encourage everyone to complete it. Again, the resources discussed today, including the PowerPoint slides and helpful links will all be shared with the attendees. Thank you very much.